Good morning, everyone, and uh, this is Mark Erkin, and I want to welcome everybody again to our Friday morning virtual journal club. Um, this is an, um, will undoubtedly be a wonderful session um, with two experts in the field. Our presenter this morning is Dr. Anupam Katwal, um, who is an assistant professor of medicine in the Division of Diabetes, Endocrinology, and Metabolism at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Uh, Dr. Cotwell completed his fellowship in endocrinology at the Mayo Clinic, where he authored this morning's um, uh, article entitled Predicting Outcomes in Sporadic and Hereditary Medullary Thyroid Carcinoma Over Two Decades. Dr. Cobwall is actively involved in thyroid cancer research and is involved nationally as a member of the ATA, Endocrine Society, and ACE. And our discussion, uh, discussant this morning um, is someone who has uh, been a part of this uh, program in the past. Um, Dr. A.L. Robenstock is both a friend and colleague, and um, he is an endocrinologist and thyroid cancer specialist at the Rabin Medical Center. Um, where he directs the thyroid cancer research, um, I'm sorry, thyroid cancer service at the Davidoff Cancer Center um, in Israel. Dober, Dr. Robenstock did his training in Israel and then traveled to the, US to the U.S. to complete a thyroid cancer fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, he is actively involved in thyroid cancer research and was awarded uh, the prestigious Lindner Prize of the Israeli um, Endocrine Society and recognition for his contributions in the field of thyroid cancer. And with that, um, I, I again want to welcome our panelists and um, encourage everyone to uh, enter questions, which I will try to get to by the end of the hour. Um, so, um, gentlemen, thank you very much. And Anupam, um, you have uh, you have the platform here. Okay, um, thank you and um, um, thank you for this opportunity to present our study here. Um, the study was performed at Mayo Clinic where during my fellowship um, there a couple of years ago and um, the senior author is Dr. Um, M. Regina Castro. I'm going to start here. I have no conflicts of interest pertaining to this presentation. Now, uh, medullary thyroid cancer, we know, is associated with significant morbidity and mortality, especially in the advanced cases. Classically, older age and the stage at the time of diagnosis have been shown to be the strongest predictors of poor prognosis of medullary thyroid cancer or MTC. Our group at Mayo Clinic previously has shown in 65 MTC patients who were followed from 1946 to 1970 that a higher stage was also a strong predictor for worse overall survival. More recently, the prognostic value of uh, biomarker doubling time, such as calcitonin doubling time, has been uh, demonstrated. However, in most cases, the disease progression has already occurred by the time these tumor markers start increasing rapidly. And this underlies the importance of analyzing perioperative factors uh, to look at the prognosis of MTC. Now, these factors have been investigated in a few large cohorts. However, some studies did not stratify patients, uh, separating them by their sporadic or hereditary MTC status. And some of them also included patients who only had C-cell hyperplasia that underwent prophylactic thyroidectomy. So to address some of these gaps in the existing knowledge, our study aimed to identify the perioperative factors predicting outcomes in patients with medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, and those outcomes included overall and disease-specific survival, as well as uh, local regional recurrence or persistence and uh, distant metastases. So this study retrospectively analyzed the Mayo Clinic medullary thyroid cancer cohort to identify adult MTC or uh, medullary thyroid cancer patients uh, that underwent surgery at Mayo Rochester from January 1995 through December 2015. Nine patients were excluded either due to uh, presence of C-cell hyperplasia alone, absence of research authorization, or uh, absence of follow-up after surgery, as mentioned here. 
Finally, 163 adult MTC patients were included for analysis in this study, and they were followed for a median of five and a half years from the time of their initial thyroid cancer surgery till the most recent clinic visit or death. The assessment of uh, preoperative uh, factors uh, included a comprehensive neck ultrasound in all patients, serum calcitonin measurement in most patients. Uh, additional imaging was performed if the initial serum calcitonin was quite elevated, um, and uh, biopsy of suspicious lateral neck lymph nodes was performed to guide the extent of surgery in the uh, preoperative setting. Postoperatively, like usual care, uh, most patients uh, had uh, neck ultrasound and uh, calcitonin and CEA measurement every six to 12 months. And additional imaging was performed if the biochemical data was discordant with initial neck ultrasound, suggesting distant disease or more uh, widespread disease. Now, in terms of outcomes, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the study looked at overall survival or OS disease-specific survival, or DSS, the local regional recurrence or persistence characterized by either the recurrence of disease or persistence of disease in the uh, central neck or uh, the lateral neck, and uh, occurrence of new distant metastases during the follow-up of the patients. Uh, P-value less than 0.05 was used for statistical significance. And because the number of outcome events, that is uh, the number of uh, uh, disease specific and uh, total deaths were limited in our study, uh, we chose to include only the highly specific, uh, significant variables with a p-value less than 0.001 into the multivariable model. So how did this uh, MTC cohort uh, uh, look like? So the cohort had a fairly balanced sex distribution uh, with uh, about 52% of patients uh, being female. 44% presented with a palpable neck mass at their initial diagnosis. The mean age at the time of initial thyroid surgery was 48 years. Now, uh, the hereditary MTC or uh, comprise about 38% of the cohort. And this is higher than some of the other cohorts demonstrating anywhere be between 15 to 25%. We feel that this may be because uh, many MTC families are uh, followed at uh, Mayo Clinic, uh, likely accounting for the higher uh, proportion of hereditary MTC in this group. Among the patients with hereditary MTC, approximately two thirds had MEN2A. And uh, most of these patients were diagnosed by screening, so familial screening. The patients with hereditary MTC were more likely to have bilateral disease and multifocal disease as compared to patients with sporadic MTC. The majority of patients presented either with a stage one or stage one, stage four MTC, uh, like shown here in the pie chart. And this is similar to other large tertiary cohort studies. 95% underwent at least a total thyroidectomy and central neck dissection. 44% presented with multifocal and or bilateral disease. Lateral neck lymph node was present in about one third of the patients at diagnosis and 8% of patients had uh, M1 status or distant metastases at the time of their initial surgery. Now let's look at the survival rates uh, in these patients um, and the change over time. So the survival in, in our cohort was favorable, uh, similar to other large cohort studies. The five-year overall survival was close to 90% and a 10-year survival of 81%. The disease-specific survival rates were similar. We did analyze the group uh, comparing the overall as well as disease-specific survival in the patients who had the thyroid surgery in the first decade, that is from 1995 to 2005, as compared to those who had surgery from 2006 to 2015. Now, when we did that, we did not find any difference in the overall as well as the disease-specific survival. And this is uh, similar to another uh, large cohort study uh, by uh, Jung and colleagues who reported improved five-year recurrence rate uh, in the more recent years 
but they did not find any, find any difference in the five-year overall survival rates when they compared the patients who had surgery before 2005 as compared to patients who had surgery from 2006 to 2012 in their cohort. However, we also then compared this group to the previous Mayo Clinic cohort. Now, to be noted that from 1946 to 1970, uh, the tumor markers, calcitonin and CEA, were not uh, in practice. So those were not used to guide uh, the evaluation of the patient uh, or the follow-up. We did find that in our study and the more recent cohort, the survival was bred better as compared to when we look at patients before 1970. So the 10-year survival of 81% as compared to 63% in the older cohort. And uh, similarly, disease-specific survival of 85% as compared to 69% in the older cohort. Now, we don't know the, all the reasons for this, and we were not able to statistically compare uh, these, um, uh, uh, the reasons uh, behind these improved survival. Uh, but we hypothesized that some of, these, uh, uh, some of the improved trend in survival maybe because more extensive surgeries performed um, in the more recent years, including uh, routine central neck dissection, the availability of tumor markers such as calcitonin and carcinogenic antigen or CEA, um, and the better resolution of imaging modalities, uh, which can uh, find disease recurrence and persistence at an earlier stage. Now, we also aim to compare the outcomes in patients who had hereditary MTC as compared to sporadic MTC. Again, shown here is the pie chart demonstrating 38% uh, of patients who had hereditary MTC, uh, most of them being diagnosed by family screening. On the right is the uh, univariate analysis of comparing the patients with sporadic and hereditary MTC. Now, in patients with sporadic MTC, there was actually a slight um, increase in association with worse uh, overall as well as disease-specific survival, but was not statistically significant. Uh, similarly, slight increase in the uh, rate of local regional recurrence or persistence, but again, not statistically significant. So really no differences in these outcomes when comparing sporadic to hereditary MTC. However, we did find that patients with sporadic disease were more likely to have distant metastases uh, during their course, as seen by a hazard ratio of 6.7, um, as compared to patients with hereditary MTC. Now, this might seem a little bit odd as we usually feel the hereditary MTC to be more aggressive. Um, and in our group, the hereditary MTC patients did have more bilateral as well as multifocal disease. But again, we think some of these favorable outcomes could be because uh, these patients were diagnosed as well as underwent surgery at a younger age. So a surgery at a mean age of 36 to 38 years as compared to surgery in sporadic MTC patients that was at a mean age of 56 years. Most of these patients were diagnosed by family screening, so were uh, uh, diagnosed at an earlier um, and a lower disease stage. Most of them did have moderate risk uh, RET mutation, and 85% uh, were diagnosed with stage one or stage two disease at the time of their presentation, as compared to 36% of patients with sporadic MTC that had stage one or stage two disease. We also found that patients with hereditary MTC were um, uh, less likely to have a, a elevated calcitonin after their um, thyroid surgery as compared to sporadic MTC. So uh, we feel that these factors likely led to the favorable outcomes in hereditary MTC, especially in our cohort. Now let's look at some of the predictors for overall survival and disease-specific survival. In total, there were 28 deaths and 18 were considered to be uh, specific to uh, the, uh, the medullary thyroid cancer most of these in the setting of distant metastases. Uh, the factors we found to be predictive of these on univariate analysis have been shown by many other studies as well, including the older age, male sex, higher T stage or uh, AJCC uh, stage, um, a higher, uh, the larger tumor size, presence of lateral neck lymph node involvement, distant metastases, 
gross extrathyroidal extension, as well as elevated post-op calcitonin and CEA. The number of lymph nodes involved and the post-op uh, CEA was only uh, predictive of worse overall survival, but not linked to uh, worse disease-specific survival. Again, this could be due to the limited number of events um, in our study. Interestingly, we did not find that uh, the presence of multifocal disease, so multiple foci of MTC in the same lobe, or bilateral disease, so presence of MTC in both the right and the left lobe of the thyroid, to be associated with worse overall or disease-specific survival. Just showing here the Kaplan-Meier curves. Um, so on the left side is the overall survival, and on the right, the disease-specific survival separating patients that had stage three or four disease, um, showing um, a worse uh, survival as compared to patients that had stage one or two disease, showing a very favorable overall and disease specific survival. Now let's look at the local regional recurrence or persistence, as well as uh, the occurrence of distant metastases during the course of follow-up in these patients. In total, there were 16 patients who had local regional disease during their follow-up and 25 had uh, presence of distant metastases. On univariate analysis, the factors here um, are similar to those that were predictive for worse uh, survival rates. Uh, we did find that post-operative calcitonin uh, level was very strongly associated with uh, the presence of local regional disease or distant metastases, um, and it's not surprising here, uh, uh, the, the association. We did find that age, more than 55 years, and the ratio of calcitonin to CEA were, in addition, predictive of uh, the occurrence of distant metastases during the course of these patients. And again, we did not find multifocality or bilaterality to be associated with um, uh, these worse outcomes here. Now, again, as I mentioned earlier, uh, even though this was a fairly large cohort, uh, the number of outcome events, that is the number of patients that died and the patients that had um, local regional disease or distant disease during follow-up was uh, somewhat limited. So we chose to include only the very highly significant, uh, that is with a p-value less than 0.001 factors into the multivariable analysis. So just to summarize this table, uh, we found that gross extrathyroidal extension um, with a hazard ratio of 6.6 .6 and uh, the presence of distant metastases at initial surgery, so M1 status, with a hazard ratio of 10.4 were the strongest predictors of disease-specific survival. The lateral neck lymph node involvement, gross extrathyroidal extension, or ETE, and a high post-operative calcitonin level were the strongest predictors of both local regional recurrence or persistence, as well as distant metastases during the course of these patients. And then, um, just to mention that we did not add stage into this multivariable model because we added the different components of it. Um, so that would uh, not be used for statistical testing in the multivariable model. We did not find the ratio, uh, the ratio of calcitonin to CEA to be predictive of outcomes uh, when adjusted for other variables. Now, just to highlight the uh, strongest predictors for a worse disease-specific survival in MTC, on the left is uh, the uh, Kaplan-Meier curves for distant metastases. So um, the patients who had M0 or who did not have distant metastases at initial uh, thyroid surgery had a 10-year disease-specific survival of uh, 90%, whereas those with distant metastases at initial surgery M1 status had a 10-year disease-specific survival of 28%. Similarly, gross extrathyroidal extension, the patients who uh, did not have this at initial presentation had a 10-year disease-specific survival more than 90%, whereas those with gross extrathyroidal extension of the tumor had a 10-year disease-specific survival of 45%.
Now, what is the role of demographic factors such as age and sex? Uh, we did uh, analyze these in our cohort. Uh, we did not, we, uh, in our cohort, the demographic factors of age and sex uh, were not predictive of outcomes on the multivariable analysis, except for age more than 55 years. So um, as shown earlier, the age more than 55 years was predictive of worse overall survival alone, not associated with disease-specific survival. Now we know that this is traditionally not including in, included in the uh, risk stratification and staging systems for MTC, uh, but has been shown by multiple other studies that patients who are at an older age at presentation with the MTC would have worse outcomes. The male sex, uh, the data on this has been somewhat conflicting. Uh, some studies have not shown any association with outcomes and others have so, shown association with worse outcomes in men who have MTC. In our study, uh, male sex was associated with poor outcomes, but only on univariate analysis. So in our multivariable analysis, we looked at um, which variable was needed to be added for the male sex not to be associated with outcomes. And we found that uh, the uh, association between male sex and poor outcomes uh, uh, lost uh, statistical significance after adjusting for the post-op calcitonin value. So now again, this uh, we're, we're uh, presuming that this could be a reason um, for why men with MTC have worse outcomes. It is possible that they have uh, a higher burden of disease at their initial presentation, as would be suggested uh, by the fact that they have higher post-operative calcitonin levels. And when we adjust for that, really there is no association between male sex and a worse outcome of MTC. So um, just to go over the limitations of the study, and I again looked at our um, cohort and um, analyzed this again, uh, just to make sure I wasn't missing any of the limitations more than what we already um, uh, wrote in the paper. So it's a retrospective chart review study. Um, and again, we were not able to collect any missing data on a prospective basis. Uh, the limited number of uh, outcome events, so the number of patients that were dying, the number of patients who were having local regional disease or distant metastases um, was limited. So we were able to look at some of the predictors for this, uh, but this did not allow us to look at the predictors for outcomes, uh, specifically within the hereditary uh, MTC group or the sporadic MTC group, um, or compare, say, the patients who had hereditary disease diagnosed by screening, uh, we think, you know, they would have better outcomes um, as compared to those who were diagnosed um, uh, by presentation, either clinically or uh, radiologically. The limited number of events also did not allow us to do a more robust multivariable analysis, and uh, again, somewhat limited as to how many factors we included in our multivariable analysis. Uh, the data was collected from a tertiary referral center, so this would uh, uh, make it susceptible to a selection bias, as in there would be more patients with aggressive thyroid cancer. However, as we saw, a uh, majority of the patients had either stage one disease, but the high proportion also had stage four disease. Uh, still, we found favorable outcomes in terms of the overall as well as disease-specific survival in this group. Now, the calcitonin and CEA doubling times have been demonstrated in, in studies to be uh, associated with disease progression. Uh, those were not analyzed in this study, but again, it was not a focus of the study uh, with uh, the aim of which was to look at the perioperative factors to really predict these outcomes, even before waiting for the calcitonin and CEA to rapidly increase. And then another limitation, which, which I kind of think um, is there is the disease recurrence and persistence. Um, most of the patients who had local regional disease or distant metastases at follow-up did have elevated post-operative calcitonin. Uh, so for example, only two of the 16 patients with local regional disease at the last follow-up had a post-op calcitonin that was less than 10. So we feel that most of these are indeed uh, persistence of disease rather than a true true recurrence. And because of the limited number of events, we could not compare uh, the patients who had a true 
recurrence, which would be very few as compared to th those who had persistence of disease that then just made itself more apparent during follow-up. But there are strengths here. Um, the management and close follow of patients uh, that occurred at a tertiary care center by a specialized team of uh, thyroidologists, oncologists, and thyroid surgeons um, is definitely a strength of the study. In addition, uh, the completeness of data in terms of the MTC characteristics, the genetic status, the post-op calcitonin testing, as well as the, um, uh, the follow-up of these patients, median of about five and a half years, and only few patients excluded uh, due to not having enough follow-up are also strengths of the study, which allows us to uh, be confident in the estimates of the um, uh, overall as well as disease-specific survival. Now, the sample size was uh, not large enough to look at the different subtypes of MTC and uh, look at predictors within those subtypes. However, it was um, uh, large enough to give us enough power to evaluate the predictors for survival as well as disease recurrence or persistence um, in this cohort of MTC patients. So to summarize, um, our study demonstrated that in a um, uh, cohort of patients with medullary thyroid cancer, the presence of distant metastases at the time of surgery or M1 status and gross extrathyroidal extension of the tumor were the strongest predictors of a worse disease-specific survival. Involvement of lateral neck lymph nodes, gross extrathyroidal extension, and a high post-operative calcitonin were the strongest predictors of local regional recurrence or persistence of disease or the presence of distant metastases uh, during the course of the disease. Demographic factors were not predictive of these outcomes when adjusted for other variables, except for age, uh, more than 55 years, uh, which was associated with worse overall survival, um, even after adjusting for other factors. So to conclude, we um, uh, uh, found from the study that the disease burden at time of initial surgery, as well as the biochemical response, appeared to be more important than most demographic factors for medullary thyroid cancer prognosis. And these findings would highlight the importance of a rigorous perioperative assessment uh, to better predict the outcome and course of patients with medullary thyroid cancer. And with that, I would like to thank the uh, uh, institutions that I've worked at and uh, the senior author on the study, Dr. Uh, Castro. And um, thank you all for listening. Um, I am happy to take any questions. Hi, everyone. Um, we'll have questions in the, at the end. Uh, my name is Ian Robinstock, and it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me today to discuss this topic. And when building this presentation, I was thinking, well, I don't want to do an overview of, of uh, uh, thyroid cancer because we all treat uh, medullary thyroid cancer. So I just want to focus on what's new. And happily, despite it being such a rare disease, we have a lot of new data to discuss. So these are my disclosures. I'm just having, okay, I'm just having trouble seeing my presentation. Okay, this is it. These are my disclosures and the topics we're gonna cover, there are only four topics. The first one would be the TNM staging and we'll see how Dr. Catwell study that he presented, how it fits in to, to what we already know and we'll compare what we, with the, the predictive value of TNM staging versus calcitonin doubling time, which is something we routinely use in clinical practice. We'll go over new data about germline RET mutations, and this is fascinating. Turns out that the uh, classification as a, a moderate risk or high risk is probably incorrect, and we'll see the data that uh, suggests otherwise. We'll discuss what's the best imaging modality. It's not what's recommended in the 2015 guidelines. We have new data about that. 
and we'll shortly discuss the new era of RET inhibitors and how it affects the way we treat patients. So let's start with TNM staging and we'll start in 2005. We'll go back to 2005. This is a, a landmark study by, from France, Barbara et al. They looked at 65 patients with elevated calcitonin with mean follow-up of uh, almost 10 years. And at 10 years, 29% of patients died um, to, to assess the mortality rate using different tools. So what they used is the HSCC TNM classification, back then it was the eighth, the sixth edition, and compared it to calcitonin doubling time. So here you see the TNM staging. They didn't have any stage one disease, only stage two, three, and four. And what you can see is that the lines of these three stages are not that far apart. So, for example, if someone has stage three or stage four, um, they both had moderately bad um, prognosis, but it didn't really differentiate well between groups. However, when they looked at calcitonin doubling time, the lines are much more sever separated. So if the calcitonin doubling time was more than two years, at 10 years, the mortality rate was zero. If the calcitonin doubling time was less than 0 0.5, it was almost 100% mortality rate. And between six months and two years, it was uh, in between. We can look at the numbers here. So we want to look at the 10 year survival of this column. And if you look at the TNM staging, stage two, three, and four, you see that the survival rate is different, but the distinction is not very strong. But if you look at calcitonin doubling time, not all points, only the first four points. So the data that we gather during the first year or two years of follow-up, you see that patients with uh, long calcitonin doubling time, more than two years, have an excellent prognosis between six months and two years in the middle, and below six months, the prognosis was really uh, poor. So this study back in 2005 suggested that calcitonin and CA doubling times, the data was similar for CA, was very powerful, a very powerful prognostic indicator. And back then it was superior to initial staging. So that was AGCC edition number six. Let's see what happens today. Today we're using the eighth edition, uh, which was published in 2018. And after it was published, a study from Korea uh, published their analysis. The, they evaluated how well this classification predicts mortality. So they evaluated 182 patients from Korea, median follow-up 95 months, and mortality rate was not that high, 9.9%, but still they were able to do the statistics and show the, the value of each uh, AJCC staging. So the, the staging looks like that, and we won't go over that, but if it looks really familiar, it's because it's the same as we use in DTC, just without the age cutoff. So here on the left, you see the seventh edition, and on the right, you see the eighth edition of the AJCC classification, and how it performed. Um, it looks the same because only two patients out of 182 patients uh, were reclassified between the two editions. And it's interesting to say that the seventh edition was the same for DTC and medullary thyroid carcinoma. And the first time medullary thyroid carcinoma has a new standalone uh, TNM staging is in the eighth edition, the only problem is exactly the same as the seventh edition, just without the age cutoff of uh, 55. And the performance of this classification is, is moderate. The AUC at 10 years was 0 0.68. What does it mean? Uh, 0 0.5 is a flip of a coin, and one is perfect prediction. 
So 0 0.7 is what was, co was considered fair prediction. So we, we need to do better. We want the staging, stage one, two, three, and four, to tell us how the patient is going to perform in the next 10 years. And it doesn't, it's not as good as we want it to be. Now, looking at the current study that we discussed today, Dr. Katwa presented, has some very new, interesting data that will be able to, to be incorporated in the next AJCC guidelines to make staging better. So, looking only at the multivariable analysis, they show that N1B was not a significant predictor of mortality after accounting for M1 disease. So it should be a pretty weak uh, component of upstaging classification. Patient had worse overall survival with raw sexual thyroid extension, with metastatic disease, with increasing age, over the age of 55, male and high calcitonin. Again, calcitonin was a very strong predictor here, not the, the doubling time that we discussed before, but rather the, the post-operative native of calcitonin. The worst disease-specific survival, these are the strongest predictors, were gross extrathyroid extension and N1 disease, and they should have a strong role in upgrading, upstaging patients uh, in the next um, AJCC classification. And here you see on the left, the uh, gross exothyroid extension and on the right M1 disease. So currently the AJCC staging for medullary is a pretty weak tool, but studies like this and, and similar to this will be used to improve and, and make it a more predictive tool to use. As for today, we can discuss it at the end of the presentation, maybe uh, doubling time is more predictive than the staging that we have. The second topic to discuss is RET testing. And we all use this uh, table from the 2015 MTC guidelines. I don't think anyone uh, remembers all the, the codons by heart, so we open it. And the different mutations are classified as moderate risk, high risk, and high yes risk. These are the meant to be patients. And the risk, the moderate and high risk, is risk of aggressiveness of MTC. But in 2017, this study was published from the MD Anderson Cancer Center. And look at what the heading says. Medullary thyroid carcinoma in N men to A, ATA moderate or high risk Red mutations do not predict disease aggressiveness. So what, what is it all about? So this is from MD Anderson. They have a lot of patients, 125, seven patients with moderate risk disease and 135 patients with high risk disease. These are the mutations. You can see that high risk was mostly three, uh, six, three, four codon mutations and the moderate risk, we have multiple types of mutations. You don't need to go over this table. I just want to highlight this. The median age was different. So patients with high-risk disease, the age of presentation was 23, the median age, and moderate risk, the, uh, the age was higher at presentation, 42.3 years. So this is very statistically significant. If you look at the p-value column on the right, you see that most other features were pretty similar. I just want you to note that the T3 and T4 disease was a little more common in the moderate risk uh, group. So in the moderate risk at the presentation had slightly more aggressive disease, locally aggressive, but this could be, again, because of screening and, and selection bias. There was no difference in stage at presentation, at end stage at presentation, or 
distant metastasis. So now on multivariable analysis for overall survival, the factors that were associated with increased mortality were increasing age, T3 or T4 tumor, and M1 disease, distant metastasis. This is the same as the study that we've just heard, but high-risk mutations were not associated with worse overall survival or development of distant metastasis. So here you see the overall survival. The ones that did slightly better were the high-risk patients. And here, development of distant metastasis, again, the ones who did slightly better, the higher line is the high-risk group. So it seems that patients who have high-risk disease have presentation at a younger age, but they don't have more aggressive disease once diagnosed. So the conclusion of the study is that patients with high and moderate risk red mutation have similar overall survival, so the guidelines need to be changed. And they suggest that future guidelines consider red mutation classification by disease onset, early versus late, rather by risk of aggressiveness, high versus moderate. So this is very high quality data, very interesting data, that for sure will change the classification of these mutations in the next MTA, MTC guidelines. So we've talked about staging, we've talked about new data about germline mutations. Now, what is the best imaging modality for patients with medullary thyroid carcinoma? If you look at the, the guidelines from 2015, you need to do if a patient has high calcitonin, you need to do an ultrasound and it's CT of the neck and, and chest, uh, three-phase CT or contrast enhanced MRI of the liver, axial MRI and bone scan. So you need to do all of these. Well, and if you look at the next recommendation, they do not recommend using FDG or FDOPA PET CT. Now this is no longer true. Let's just show for a minute how they came to these conclusions. So the study that guided these guidelines is from 2007 from Gustavo C. And they looked at 55 patients with elevated calcitonin. And they looked which uh, modality, which imaging modality detected which lesion. So for example, if you look at the neck, ultrasound detected the most. If you look at the mediastinum, CT was the best. Lungs, again, CT. Liver, MRI was the best. Bones, you needed both an MRI and a scan. So this is how they came to the conclusion that you need to use all of these modalities. Luckily for us, the same group, this time from Gustave Roussy, this time headed by Sophie Le Boulou, again looked in 2019 whether new modern uh, tools can be used to assess disease spread in these patients. So they looked at 36 patients with a median calcitonin of 760, and they did an almost unbelievable amount of imaging for each patient. So each patient had a neck ultrasound, DOPA PET-CT, FDG PET-CT, whole body CT scan, whole body MRI and bone scan, and all of these tests were performed in each patient within four months. I don't think anyone else could do such a study, but they did it. So let's see what they found. Again, it's a table to show each modality and each combination, how well it detected all the lesions. So overall, there were 74 lesions to be detected. The best combination was FDOPA, plus MRI, plus CT, plus ultrasound, but going further deeper, going deeper, they saw that the CT was not required. So this combination detected all lesions. It sounds really good, but they caution, they, they, they put a word of caution about the DOPA PET in this context. The intensity of uptake in the lesions were pretty low as opposed 
to, to neuroendocrine tumors. And you need to use the early acquisition of, of uh, DOPA PET-CT, which detest, detected the most, and late acquisition was not as good. So the combination of DOPA PET in, in a place that, is, that is, uh, has expertise in this type of tests, in medullary retired carcinoma, so the combination of DOPA PET-CT with liver and MRI and neck ultrasound detected all 74 lesions and will now be probably in the next guidelines, will be the preferred way to detect distant metastasis in MTC patients with high calcitonin. And the last couple of words about RET inhibitors. It is a new era in treating patients with uh, advanced uh, MTC. In 2020, last year, the FDA approved two drugs, two RET inhibitors, serpricatinib and pralcetinib. Both had very good uh, uh, data. I won't go over it because Lori Worth uh, presented just a couple of weeks ago the data from the New England Journal uh, study about serpricatinib. But let's just take a, a, an overview of how it changes the way we do things. So up to last year, we had multi-kinase inhibitors that were approved for medullary thyroid carcinoma. We had vandetanib and cabozantinib. Both of these are multi-kinase inhibitors, so they treat the target that we want them to treat, but they have effects on many other kinases in other parts of the body, so they have a lot of side effects. And when we move to more targeted treatments, we get the benefit with much better safety profile. So what we can say about the new RET inhibitors, they require sequencing. They require next generation sequencing. So if up to now patients would come with advanced disease, we wanted to start systemic therapy, we would just start therapy. There was nothing, no uh, workup we had to do. This time, when we have this group, these uh, and new medications we need to use to send patients for next generation sequencing. Many times we need to do a, a biopsy from a lesion to send the lesion. These are somatic mutations. So we want a sample of a lesion to send for sequencing. These uh, medications are very effective with or without previous treatment with multikinase inhibitors. And this is very important. We have a lot of patients already on vandetanib or cabozantinib, if we'll move them, if we'll switch to RET inhibitors, we'll expect to get the full benefit of these medications. They penetrate BBB, so they are effective for brain metastasis. We have two patients with very impressive response of brain metastasis, and most of the adverse events are pretty mild, grade one or two, so these are a new era in the way we treat medullary thyroid cancer. So today, in patients with advanced MTC, we start with local therapy, either surgery, radiation, embolization of liver lesions. But if that's not enough and the disease progresses, we'll send for next generation sequencing, sequencing if covered, if we can get it. And in patients who have RET mutation, somatic RET mutation, about 70% of patients will be treated with RET inhibitors, and the rest will be treated with approved multikinase inhibitors. So in summary, we have, we have some progress in staging of MTC, and studies like we discussed today are a step forward in improving these staging system. Germline RET mutation in MEN2A should be classified based on age and not risk. And maybe it explains some of the data presented today that patients with MEN2A didn't have more aggressive uh, disease than sporadic, though this is a different question. Optimal imaging for high calcitonin, patients with high calcitonin, is DOPA-PET-CT, liver MRI, and neck ultrasound. 
And in advanced disease, we would now send uh, specimens for NGS and in patients who have RET mutations, we would use RET inhibitors. So as we can see, despite being a very rare disease, we have some significant progress in, la in the last uh, couple of years since the last guidelines. And I think we'll all be waiting for the next guidelines, which will have a lot of uh, new uh, approaches and new data. Thank you. Terrific. I'll thank you um, for a wonderful discussion. And uh, Dr. Cobwell, thank you very much for a really stimulating uh, presentation of that data. Um, one of the things that, uh, first of all, I'll give Dr. Cobwell an opportunity to um, respond to any of um, Dr. Robenstock's comments here. Is there anything that in particular you'd like to uh, pick up on? Mm. No, not nothing specific, but I uh, I appreciated how uh, kind of um, you were talking about the staging and how the updates uh, to the next iteration of the staging can be made uh, based on this data and really how like adjusting for the distant metastases. Once you do that, the the outcome is not at least the survival would not be predicted by by lateral neck lymph nodes. So um, yeah, thank you. Okay, great. So one of the things I'd like to um, um, ask and see if you can address um, the failure to see improvement in the two different decades under study um, during the um, uh, that were included in your data analysis, um, and then um, where there was no significant difference in disease-specific survival based on decade, and then you did do um, sort of a, a, a comparison to an, a historical cohort from 1946 to 1970. Do you have any sense on comparative stage of presentation and um, whether or not duration of follow-up was comparable in those um, in your current versus your historical cohort? So yes, that's a, that's a good question. We were not able to statistically compare the our cohort to the previous Mayo cohort because we did not have access to Again, it was a different actually group altogether. Uh, we do not have access to all the individual patient data. So this is just showing that the, uh, the numbers look better uh, but and quite better. Um, the the follow-up was similar, was a little bit, I, I think it was between three to five years for median overall um, uh, follow-up in the older cohort. Um, and again, was still a fairly complete data set. Uh, but again, without any tumor marker uh, measurement at that time. So it did show there is improved survival and that's kind of been shown uh, uh, in like general, we know there has been improved survival in MTC, uh, but we were not able to get into the specific of uh, the exact factors or actually use a statistical comparison there. Great, okay, thank you. Um, so you you commented on worse um, uh, that on um, worse outcomes when the calcitonin nadir was less than didn't achieve less than 10 um, picograms per ml. Um, can you comment on two different things? When is the earliest time in your protocol um, for both of you um, that you begin to search for uh, persistent disease and um, uh, and what the likelihood of cure is when patients uh, do show persistence uh, after initial therapy. Maybe if you could both take up that those two topics here. Please, please start. Um, well, um, we usually kind of, you know, check the uh, calcium, calcitonin, and see at the three to six month mark, and then. Um, Less than 10, 10 is great. I think between the 10 to 100, 150, especially if it's staying stable, will probably not have distant disease. Um, and then more than that, we start evaluating for distant disease. Um, again, the doubling time and also this kind of um, ratio of calcitonin to CEA. So if the CEA is rising much more, maybe suggesting a dedifferentiated MTC there. Uh, but again, that's a little unclear data. Uh, but as long as it's stable and like, you know, less than 100 or so, and there was significant improvement, uh, we mostly just look locally um, um, 
and if we don't find any disease and calcitonin remains stable, then unlikely to be distant disease there. I'm happy to hear what uh, Dr. Obishtok's approach there. So we checked for calcitonin a little earlier. First, I checked usually within a month because there were some studies showing that if the calcitonin is undetectable, it's going to be undetectable within a month. And then at three months, we look to, we'll see the nadir probably at three months most of the time. And if we see the lower the calcitonin, the happier we are. But we always are want to wait um, some six months, one year, two years to see the doubling time. Because I, I guess we all had patients who had high calcitonin that remained stable for years and years, and patients with low calcitonin just kept on rising as patients had severe disease. So obviously we look at all the, the clinical data that we have. We, we know if someone has a very aggressive disease just to begin with, but um, just the calcitonin, we need some, some time. We need to see the doubling time, such a strong predictor that it's, it's a bit complicated to explain to patients I really know what, what his status is going to be within a year or two years. But we, we explained that within the big picture. And could you both comment a little bit on the likelihood of, um, of, of benefiting uh, um, long-term survival through uh, an attempts at salvage surgery when you identify local regional disease here? Do you have any data that would support, um, obviously, uh, eliminating um, for the fact that uh, the local disease within the thyroid bed um, is something we all strive to um, to overcome. But in terms of nodal disease in the neck, um, uh, what what the benefits are of going back and reoperating in terms of um, longer term survival here? Please, I, I'll let Dr. Robin talk. Maybe give his input on this first. Okay. So it really depends on what's the overall status of the patient, if they have distant metastasis or not, if they have very high calcitonin or not. So if the calcitonin is not that high and patients have only neck disease, we would try to, to have um, surgery, obviously not for millimeter or two uh, metastasis, but for significant disease, we would go to surgery and we, want, we would want to have as complete surgery as possible. But patients who have aggressive disease and distant metastasis, we just want to keep the neck safe. So if we have a lesion uh, near the trachea, near vital organs, we'll go to surgery. If it's in the lateral neck, we'll be more patient um, and send for NGS, because if patients have distant metastasis and red mutation, then we won't rush to surgery and maybe uh, we'll see when we're going to start treatment. Obviously, it's going to be a little sooner compared to patients who start on multi-kinase inhibitors, which affect patients' life much, much more. Great, thank you. In the time remaining, I just want to see if um, each of you can perhaps speculate over the, what you think will be the best, um, will be the great advance in the next five years or 10 years that's really gonna move the needle with respect to um, changing uh, disease-specific survival. Where do you think that um, next breakthrough is going to come from? Please. I would say, um, you know, the targeted therapies, um, um, especially the, the, you know, the red and the uh, targeted therapies that would not affect other, um, um, uh, other mutations, et cetera. And then of course the improved uh, imaging modalities um, to, get, to catch the disease uh, or recurrence or spread sooner. Those would be my, my two takes. So the RET inhibitors are very promising, but we know there are re mechanisms of resistance. So if we'll be able to overcome these mechanisms of resistance, I think the ideal would be to have specific therapies with little side effects, and to make uh, patients with advanced disease just have a chronic status, they're gonna be on, on a medication and just live their lives. So for that, we'll have to overcome the, the resistant mechanisms. Terrific. Well, thank you both. We have gone one minute over a lot, our allotted time. 
I can't thank um, you enough for your outstanding presentations and discussion here this morning. I encourage everybody um, who's, uh, who's joined us this morning to come back again next Friday. Um, and we look forward to, uh, um, to another wonderful discussion. Thank you both and everybody stay safe here. Bye. Bye-bye.